Welcome to Fireside Giants. My name is Alex with my co-host here, Anthony Rivardo. If you're watching on YouTube and you check out my awesome shirt, this is actually what I'm going to be wearing for most Giants games now because it actually has the ingredients for an alcoholic beverage, which I will need the rest of the season. So really, really clutch shirt here. Old fashioned. I'm probably going to get some ones that include bleach in them, but that's for another day. <laughs> but guys, today we want to talk about the defense. What's going on with them? What's up with James Bradbury? Why is he having a regressing season? What is going on with the pass rush when we, you know, seemingly got a couple guys back plus Aziz Ojolari? What's going on? Like, you know, why is this defense not performing to standard? They're in the bottom half of the league. I think they're ranking in the, probably after this last game, giving up 44 points. We're probably in the 25 to 32 range in actual, uh, you know, points allowed and whatnot. So we want to take a look at that, Anthony. We want to break down really what's the causation for James Bradbury taking a step backward um, and really Rodarius Williams tearing his ACL. Who is up next, right? Who is up next for this cornerback unit? Is it Darnay Holmes? Uh, that's the big question, obviously. What is the plan for week six against the Rams? Like, how do the Giants stay in this game? I mean, just saying that makes me cringe, but I don't know. But we're going to give some insight into maybe what the Giants can do to really maintain time of possession, really try and give the Rams some fits, and it's going to start with Kadarius Tony, and it's going to end with Kadarius Tony. So we're going to break that down for you guys. But, Anthony, before we do, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing all right. You know, still disappointed by the loss on Sunday, but looking ahead to the Los Angeles Rams game, that's another ceremony game for the Giants. We had Eli Manning Day on September 26th against the uh, Atlanta Falcons. This is the game where the Giants are celebrating the 10-year anniversary of the Super Bowl 46 victory. So they're going to be honoring the Super Bowl 46 team during halftime of this game. Um, and then, of course, they're going to be getting honored at Tom Coughlin's charity event this weekend, which I'm looking forward to attending. It's going to be a really good weekend, hopefully for the Giants, if they're able to come away with a win. But unfortunately, at home versus the Rams, the Rams are a really good team. They are a great football team. Sean McVay leads that team to victory nearly every week. Matt Stafford looks like an MVP candidate. Cooper Cup looks, looks like an offensive player of the year candidate. So this isn't going to be an easy matchup for the Giants. So Yes, we're probably all going to be expecting them to lose this game. We're probably going to be expecting the Giants to lose many games this season from here on out. But how could they win this game? Well, again, unfortunately, this is a team with an amazing offense. And the way you beat an amazing offense is with amazing offense. Just like I said, versus Dallas, the Giants. I said, guaranteed, the Cowboys are scoring over 30 points on the Giants. The Giants are going to have to win by scoring over 30 points. They failed to do that. Dallas went ahead and scored over 40, and we lost. And that's kind of all she wrote. So going into this game versus the Rams, once again, they're going to score probably 30 points. You know, that's almost a lock for them. They're an offensive machine. The Giants, if they don't score 30 points, they're not going to win this game. And honestly, will they score 30 points? I wouldn't bet on it. So it's a bleak outlook on this week's matchup. It's a bleak outlook on the rest of the season in general for the New York Giants. But, of course, we got plenty to discuss about this team as we continue to take the short-term and long-term approach to breaking down the New York Giants on Fireside Giants. Absolutely. And <clears throat> I want to dive into the defense for a couple minutes here because what is up, right? Is We were, you know, big Patrick Graham stands just a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, really. <clears throat> projecting this unit to be a top five secondary in the league, right? They have the personnel. James Bradbury is a good corner. Dory Jackson is a good corner. Both of them are number one corners on some teams. And Dory Jackson, you know, we've seen what he can do in the past. He's a very good, agile, quick cornerback who's done some good things against fast receivers. And then you have Bradbury, who was locked down last year, arguably a top five corner. What happened to him that he's given up four touchdowns through five games? You know, what's happened to him that he's getting burned on go routes, you know, with no help over the top? Well, there's a couple things you can attribute. Obviously, like natural progression or regression rather is um, a thing. <clears throat> and I think he set the stage. He set a standard that really was mm, difficult to maintain. Um, and I think the Giants changed their scheme enough that it's put him in kind of a precarious situation, right? I think that the lack of pass rush has really hurt the Giants' ability to play cover one um, and really get after the quarterback and, and hoping that their secondary can hold up because – once they've been beaten a couple times, they're just they're just nonstop going to those same guys. They're really finding the weak points and attacking them. CeeDee Lamb is head and shoulders faster than James Bradbury. He absolutely burned him on a niner out um, outside release. There was no help over the top. <clears throat> and essentially, Julian Love was too far out on the other side of the field. He's trying to cover up three receivers on that side. CeeDee Lamb's in man coverage with 
um, James Bradbury and he just burns him. So like, you know, there's no over the top help. What do you expect? James Bradbury is not a fast corner, right? He's more of a big possession corner with really good technique. He's not a guy that's going to catch up to speedsters. And that was a bad position to put him in. Adoree Jackson should be on CD lamb in that scenario. In my opinion, that was a bad coverage call. Um, but I think that it really correlates to the pass rush major majorly. And Dave Gittleman said, <clears throat> you know, when he was coining the different points of a team that need to be um, elite or at least above average to have a good defense, a good unit in general, pass rush and the ability to get after the quarterback was one of the ones that he really coined, um, you know, and, and mentioned as a big factor. The problem, they don't have that. He has invested little to nothing, little to nothing in edge rushers since he's been uh, – since he's been a general manager for the Giants, right? Aziz Ojolari is the biggest asset he's gotten. He's used a second round pick, 50th overall pick. That's the biggest asset he's used to go out and find an actual edge rusher. That's not a $75 million interior defender named Leonard Williams, who he gave up draft capital plus some to bring back. And, you know, Leonard Williams is a good player. Don't get me wrong, but he's not an elite edge rusher. He's not an elite edge presence. We saw Randy Gregory run Nate Solder down like, like, oh my God. Like it was, it was devastating to watch. You know, watching it on film makes it even more hurtful to the soul. But I will say, Anthony, when you're looking at Dave Gettleman's allocation of resources towards the pass rush position and him blatantly saying how important it is, how disappointing it is it to see that this Giants team barely is able to carry any pressure. I mean, they had no pressure on Dak Prescott basically the entire game unless they were sending additional blitzers. They had such a hard time breaking down that offensive line. They had a hard time getting after Matt Ryan and the Atlanta Falcons. What, how how disappointed are you to see that you know this this uh, regimen has done so little to upgrade that unit? Yeah, it's, it's rather disappointing, of course. I mean, Aziz Ojolari, of course, we all know that how much I loved him and I loved that selection. I think that he is a tremendous player, but to be honest, the Giants do need more from him. Okay, if you look at the stats this past week versus Dallas, he had zero pressures. He got to the quarterback zero times. If you look at Leonard Williams' stats, he had one total pressure and one sack. So he really only got in the backfield that one time and got Dak Prescott down. I believe that was a half a sack, if I'm not mistaken. I think he had an assist on that. So Aziz, Leonard Williams, and everybody else just failing to get after the quarterback. And now I completely understand. So you got Zach Martin, you got Tyron Smith, they're the best offensive line then in football, right? The Dallas Cowboys offensive line is tremendous. We always said that the Giants – Never had great pass rushers, but they had a coordinator that knew how to scheme together a pass rush. So far this season, we have not seen that at all. We have not seen any schemed blitzes, any schemed pass rush whatsoever. And the Giants have looked really bad on defense and quarterbacks have had all day to throw in very comfortable pockets versus a New York Giants pass rush. I mean, really the best pass rushing game from any of our pass rushers in all honesty, was week one versus Denver by Leonard Williams. He had six total pressures in that game. I know everybody's been giving him crap because he only has two sacks through five games, but that was a great performance. The problem is since then, he's had two or less pressures in every single game. So he's really not getting in the backfield. Really, for a premier pass rusher that you're paying, what, $26, $27 million per year for? You probably want them getting four pressures a game, seriously. That's like realistic number, three to four to hopefully five and six pressures a game, definitely not one or two. That's just not cutting it out. I mean, Leonard Williams, he's been MIA for a lot of this season. I know he's primarily a run defender, but to be honest, the Giants run defense has been very bad this season. It, so you're talking about the pass rush primarily, Alex. I'm also talking about the run defense, both of them, both facets of the game from the front seven have just been pitiful. They're just not doing their jobs. And then, of course, you can't have a good secondary without a good pass rush. You can't have a good pass rush without a good secondary. Really, every aspect of this Giants defense that we thought was going to be really good completely has crapped the bed and fallen apart. They've been completely disappointing. They have not met any of the expectations set by the fans, the coaches, or the, the uh, analysts that cover the team. Everything is just failing for the Giants defense right now. Can I pinpoint one true answer or one true reason why that is happening? No, I can't because it's a multi-level issue. We're not seeing scheme together pass, pass rush. We're not seeing good play calls defensively. There are still moments where, you know, you got a cornerback lined up way off in coverage and he just doesn't make the play. And then you have no safety help over top. That's a scheme thing. Of course, that was the play call there, but it's also a product of poor execution. So, Everything is going wrong for this defense. I cannot pinpoint one singular thing that is going wrong because it just seems like everything is going wrong. So, of course, you talk about the pass rush, 
We need more from guys like Aziz, from Lorenzo Carter. Um, he did have that interception that was a tremendous play, but how often was he in the backfield getting the Dak Prescott? Not very often. And that's another thing that I'll say. After that pick, I think we got zero points out of that, right? I, I think Graham going to miss a field goal on that next possession for the Giants offensively. The Giants had a few possessions where they got the ball and they had an advantage. They had a turnover that they got and they could have scored some points and the offense failed to do so. So it's really all over. It's just tragic for the Giants right now. It's so difficult to watch. They fail in every way and every shape and form. It's just, Alex, take it away. I just can't even talk about it anymore. I'm getting impressed. <laughs> Yeah, I, reliving it in my head definitely doesn't help, which is why I got the shirt to help me get over it with this alcoholic beverage. Always have the ingredients on hand. But I'll say this. There is time for them to turn around. It's not like the, the whole defense is injured, right? We saw the offense go down. They really are only missing Blake Martinez. That's the only player they're really missing due to injury. Everybody else is healthy. James Bradbury is healthy. George Jackson's healthy. Leonard Williams, healthy. Aziz Ojolari, healthy. Lorenzo Carter, healthy. They're just not doing anything. They're just not producing. Is it scheme-related? I think partially, but I also think there's something else going on that I can't really pinpoint. They've got the talent. I think that they're the. it really is just a lack of production, but it doesn't make any sense because they've got the talent. You know what I mean? Like Lorenzo Carter, we've seen him play good games. Aziz Ojolari has been our best pass rusher, and the guy's a rookie. He's played five games in an NFL career. That's disappointing to me. Um, Leonard Williams, Dexter Lawrence have mostly disappeared at times in the most important moments. Leonard, uh, Leonard Williams has had good games, but at the end of the day, he hasn't produced the sacks. He hasn't gotten the quarterback down on third downs. They've missed a lot of tackles. It seems to me like a lot of lack of discipline is one of the one of the factors playing here because missed tackles is a disciplinary thing. You know, if you're missing that many tackles, it's because you either lack the fundamentals or you just aren't going hard enough. You know, I've seen plays where they've given up. They have been extremely lazy against the um against um uh what's the team? Against the Saints specifically, there was a play where Taysom Hill broke eight tackles and Leonard Williams and Adore Jackson didn't even try to tackle the guy. You know, those plays show up on film and it was a scoring play for that matter where the guy Broke eight tackles. That does not happen, you know, against guys like that. So I think that there's a lack of discipline going on here. I think that they're in their own heads. I think that they don't care at times, um, which is really upsetting to me because they're coming off a season where expectations elevated so much because of how well they played. Logan Ryan, I don't – maybe the, there's a lack of communication there. Um, Xavier McKinney hasn't been all that great. James Bradbury, you know, he's given up 300 yards and four touchdowns. Uh, this season already, and that's through f- five games. Last year, through 16 games, or he gave up 454 yards and three touchdowns. You know what I mean? Like he's given up almost more yardage and touchdowns in five games this year compared to 16 last season. That is absurd. You know that that points to me. There's a major disconnect happening somewhere. I can't pinpoint it. It, it could be scheme related. It could be Patrick Graham. Like stick to the zone, man. Like he's a he's his own coverage corner. Like straight up, he's not a man coverage corner, and he's being exposed on a weekly basis. Um, he doesn't have the speed to be a man coverage corner like that. Like he needs help. He needs to be covering zones, and that's really what they need to go back to because it's the only thing that was working. Um, you know, be a be a defense. If you have to be a defense that is bend don't break, be that defense. But they're just giving up too many points. They're giving up too many big plays. Um, I don't know why they have to try and fix something that really wasn't broken. You know what I mean? Like, Anthony, you said that earlier this year. Like, don't try to fix something that's not broken. I definitely said that in the offseason. I said, you know, Patrick Graham kept saying they're going back to this press man scheme that he wanted to do last year, but they unsuccessfully tried. Why, man? Why? I never understood that. I said it in the offseason. If it isn't broke, don't fix it. They should really just stick with that complex disguised zone coverage scheme that they were running because it, yeah it was complex it took the players forever to understand it. it took them the first few weeks of the season it was not until after that 49ers game that they really started to get it but they got it at some point and then the defense was amazing you know they're just not getting this press man scheme if it isn't broke don't fix it one of the things that's so beautiful about that complex is disguised zone coverage scheme it's so complex it confuses a shit out of quarterbacks. That's the whole point. It confuses quarterbacks. It confuses opposing offenses and offensive coordinators, and it creates turnovers, and it creates big defensive performances. So if the Giants go back to that, if the players can get back into that role, we can see some better productivity from the defense. But unfortunately, Patrick Graham is very reliant now on this man coverage scheme. That's why Rodarius Williams was playing more. That's why they went and signed the Dory Jackson. They want to play more man coverage. They want cornerbacks to travel around with receivers and just play press man. Well, honestly, I'm sorry, guys. That's just never going to work. 
In the NFL, you have to have elite cornerbacks. James Bradbury, yes, we thought he was elite, but we thought he was elite because we watched him play in that disguised zone coverage scheme. We haven't seen him play in that man coverage scheme. And even beforehand, he was with the Carolina Panthers. The Carolina Panthers have never been a press man team. They've always been a Tampa 2 cover 2 defense, a zone defense. So why exactly did he think that James Bradbury could just transition his playing style right to man coverage? I don't know. I don't understand. This defense is not even the same scheme that they had last year. And really, it's too late already. But before it is just way too late for Patrick Graham, if he wants to save his job, I mean, he needs to go back to that zone coverage scheme, I think. And that might just save the Giants defense and potentially save his job, as I mentioned. Right. And, you know, we a lot of people have mentioned the idea that, um, you know, they don't like the soft zone. They don't like this. But that's really how it ends up being like you just don't give up big plays and you try and hope that your defense makes a play. Um, and I'd rather give up a lot of yards than give up a lot of scores, you know, especially if we're going to hold to field goals, because that's ultimately what we got to do. Our offense is is a, a big um, victim of being held to field goals and not scoring touchdowns. So why can't we do the same to others? I'm not exactly sure, but I think we have to, you know, go back to the old scheme and see what happens. So. That's something to think about. And also, I think the loss of Dalvin Tomlinson is really affecting these pass rushers. He, I mean, and BJ Hill, too, by the way, has three sacks this year. He's having his best season today. He's a, one of the Cincinnati Bengals' best run stoppers this season. We traded him for Billy Price, who um, could barely could barely block at all. Like, I, I can't even, uh, can't really describe how poor he's played at times. But end of the day, we lost a couple of big players, though. Dalvin Tomlinson was a captain. You know what I mean? Like, we, we tr- let, let captains walk, like, you know, like, how suburban housewives do with their little whites that's how we're letting captains walk these days <laughs> like it's ridiculous so i think we need to keep some of those guys um keep our captains put energy behind them show us show them that we trust them you know what i mean like we like dribble peppers he's gonna be traded he's a captain you know like half of our captains we end up letting go and like other players like they're the leaders of the team they were voted captains why are you letting them go like people trust people respect them and I think that's a big problem with this organization right now. We don't really have any f- trust and, and loyalty to the guys that put the most energy and effort into this into these teams um, and these rosters. And that's a big, big no-no to me. So I will say this, though. Um, the loss of Dalvin Tomlinson has affected Leonard Williams tremendously. It's obvious on the field. Like, he's getting double, triple teams, and he can't fight through them. He needed Dalvin Tomlinson to take up all that space, all that, all those double teams and combo blocks. He needed him there. Austin Johnson doesn't provide that same thing. Danny Shelton doesn't have the same athleticism to really get into the pocket and create. Um, and a lot of times what happened was Dalvin Tomlinson was such a good nose tackle, and he was putting so much pressure on the interior. It was forcing quarterbacks to roll out. And that's where Leonard Williams was collecting those sacks and, and then getting those coverage sacks and whatnot. So um, I think that he's missing that big his, his big friend there. So, you know, big disappointing uh, reality to face when we realized that losing some of these guys actually had a bigger impact than we originally thought would happen. Um, but let's shift over to a second to how this offense in week six can try and muster up the courage to compete against the Rams. And like I said before, it's going to start with Kadarius Tony and it's going to end with Kadarius Tony as long as he's playing. We hope that Sterling Shepard and Darius Slayton can make a comeback, at least provide Daniel Jones or whoever the hell's playing quarterback, uh, Mike Lennon, with some, you know, some sort of, I guess, weapons to work with. It's probably going to be Glennon. We're going to find out more in terms of injury relations with Daniel Jones tomorrow and how he's progressing through the protocol. But if he's not doing so well with that and Mike Lennon ends up playing, it's going to be a lot of short yardage stuff. I mean, he underthrew CJ board drastically on the interception to Trayvon Diggs. It should have been 10 yards ahead of him. Ended up, he ended up having to flatten his route parallel to the field and it ended up being uh, undercut by Diggs. So you can't be having that. And Mike Lennon's supposed to have a big arm. So that's unfortunate. <clears throat> However, he did make some good passes. There were some scenarios where I was impressed We'll get Andrew Thomas back, so that'll be a big help against Leonard Floyd, who's had a tremendous season so far generating pressure. Um, So I I think it's going to be a lot of get the ball, Kadarius Tony. Let him just do it himself. Get the ball to Sterling Shepard on those whips. Get him, get him, get guys into space. Um, But you know when you have Jalen Ramsey covering uh, your receivers, it's going to be tough. I don't think he's generally going to be able to cover Kadarius Tony all the time because he's going to travel into the slot. They're going to try and scheme him away from Jalen Ramsey at all costs. Uh, I believe the Rams do have a rookie corner playing. They, they do have a slot corner who's not that great. So we can expose that secondary if we can avoid Jalen Ramsey. 
Um, but again, easier said than done when Mike Lennon's your quarterback, man. I mean, maybe his long neck is long enough to see over the line of scrimmage and get a better view, an aerial view of the field, but don't really know how that's going to help him. Um, of course, you have Devontae Booker, who I actually think is a better scheme fit for Jason Garrett's scheme than Saquon Barkley's. He's actually better downhill runner. He turns out yards. The guy fights really hard. However, he's not an explosive player. He's not going to carry, he's not going to take the ball, um, for 50 yards to the house. He's not going to be a good receiver. He dropped a pass last week that was right in the bread basket. Um, he's not a guy you can rely on in the receiving game. So Anthony, you know, when you're looking ahead to this game, who's the catalyst? It has to be Kadarius Tony and nobody else. There really is nobody else. Yeah, this offense is going to run through Kadarius Tony, I think. And I'm even going to throw something a little wild out there. Should the Giants consider making Kadarius Tony the quarterback? Like, should they seriously consider having him play some quarterback? I mean, we know that he can throw. We I like the Wildcat idea. It. The Wildcat quarterback for like half of the game. Like, sure, they need to pass. They Lamar 2.0. The they need to throw it to Kadarius Tony. Mike Glennon, go in there, throw some passes. Just don't turn the ball over, right? But when they need to run the ball and they need to play a more run-heavy offense or they need some explosive plays out of their quarterback, maybe Kadarius Tony should go and line style. up at quarterback in the backfield. Taysom Hill style, right? Except a little little less bulky and stocky. You know, Taysom Hill is kind of a beast. But listen, man, Kadarius Tony is a true offensive weapon. The Giants can do whatever they want with him. They can line him up in the backfield as a running back, as a quarterback, and obviously out wide and in the slot as a receiver. So when you're talking about Kadarius Tony, the offense needs to run through him this week. But the other player outside of Kadarius Tony who could be uh, impactful this week is if Sterling Shepard comes back from injury, there's discussion that he's likely to play again. That's what I'm reading. That's what I'm seeing on Twitter and from the beat writers. There's a really good chance that Sterling Shepard plays again. Keep in mind, Sterling Shepard was having a career year before he got injured against the Falcons through those two and two games in one quarter or whatever it was. But he was playing really well, and he was playing really well all training camp, all preseason. So maybe he can come in and look like a pretty good player. Um, coming off of his injury and kind of bounce back. So that's another player to keep in mind. Evan Engram had four targets, caught all four of them this past week, and had four first downs on all of those targets. So he's coming off of a really good performance against the Dallas Cowboys. Maybe he can continue to build on that. That is one that I think is important for the Giants. Have him continue to have good games and play really well down the stretch because the trade deadline is coming up. And I do think that Evan Engram is a player that the Giants still, even if he starts playing better, should consider trading, even if he is playing better, because you can probably yield a higher draft pick. At this point, the Giants doesn't look like they're really going to compete, right? I think we're all on the same page. So it's probably time to start offloading some of these assets and gaining some draft picks for the future. Evan Engram being a prime example of that. So going forward, yeah, Evan Engram, let's hope he has a good game for the sake of our future. Let's hope Kadarius Tony has a good game for the sake of our future. Let's hope that Sterling Shepard has a good game just because I like Sterling Shepard, want to see him perform well. And also Devontae Booker. I'm going to pick him up in fantasy because, yes, I was the moron that drafted Saquon Barkley. So I need to I fix him at all costs for I this know, reason. Dude. Exactly. Listen, I was in this I told one you, league don't and everyone him. was like, you have to take him, bro. You're the Giants fan in this league. You're the only Giants fan. Just take him. I'm like, fine, screw it. I'll take him. I didn't take him in one league. I took him in the other one league, I'm in third. The other league, I'm in 12th. So that tells My you a lot. My prediction was spot Saquon on. Barkley. I said the first two weeks, he's going to suck. He's going to he's gonna pick it up in week three, and then he's going to get hurt at some point during the season. That is literally what I yep. predicted, and it yep. is now occurring, and that is why I avoided him at all costs. I took Devontae Adams over him, and I'm very happy with my decision. Dude, you want to hear my team? Okay, so I, it's Sunday, I started Daniel Jones at quarterback. I started Saquon Barkley at running back, and I started Clyde oh. edwards Elair at running back. Ooh. All you three like four of them points. got hurt. All yeah. three of them. Yeah, my team put up 180 leagues. points in a 10 team league this week. I had yeah, an I, absolute. I, I beat a guy who he had 154 points. I beat him 178 points. Like my team wow. actually, I had Kadarius Tony, which I some people thought I'd be a madman to start him. Ended up being a genius. You and I'm going to start him this week too. I'm going to keep freaking starting him. Um, I started Cordero Patterson, Cooper Cup, Devontae Adams, Terry McLaurin, Justin Herbert, who had 40 points. Absolute monster. Jonathan Taylor, who was a monster game last night. Um, yeah, my team, and then Mike Kosicki, who literally is my toss. I don't have a tight end. That's really good, so unfortunate there. But <laughs> my team is picking it up. I started off as the worst team, and now uh, I picked up Cordell Patterson, and now I got a running back solution next to Jonathan Taylor. So <laughs> I had Miles Sanders. I benched him. Actually, I'm thinking about dropping his ass, um, not only because he's an Eagles player, but because he Dude, actually he plays sucks. Philly, yeah. He sucks. He's absolutely garbage. He's garbage. He's so bad. He doesn't do anything ever. Um, mostly because the Eagles are f- playing from behind and they like, somehow squeak out wins in the last second. That game last night, though, was awesome. If you watched any of it, such a good game um, between the uh, the Colts and Ravens. Wow. Missed field goals. 
a lot of missed field goals this week, I noticed. Kind of interesting. Um, but guys, tomorrow we're going to come out. We're going to break down some film for you. Take a look at Nate Solders, uh, his his poor performance, and that's a, a nice way to put it. Uh, we're going to take a look at Arius Tony. I want to take a look at some of his films, some of those routes, some of those moves. Not much to break down, really just to watch in awe for the most part. Maybe we'll just do a reaction video to Darius Tony's moves. Just like, holy crap, man. The guy is electric. Um, they even got 10 plus points on from ESPN for the punch. Unbelievable. So <laughs> a really nice game from him there. His best game to date. He won the uh, PFF Rookie of the Week award. He had the best receiving grade of any receiver this week over Devontae Adams, who had 203 uh, yards and a touchdown. So just an awesome all-around performance on Kadarius Tony. We're going to take a look at him, take a look at Solder. Maybe we'll throw in some Matt Pert there for you guys to make sure you um, see how well he performed if he did um, perform as well as the grades show and, and his pressures and whatnot show. So excited to take a look at that stuff. But I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe below on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube. And we'll catch you guys on the next New York Giants video. Thank you.